welcome to Bad Ideas, the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg, and today I'm bringing you the tale of the Love Canal. Sounds saucy. It does, but it's not. <laughs> Before we get into the story, I do want to thank listener John Stevens, who has recommended this topic to us. And also became a new patron recently. Oh, that's even better. I was going to say, <laughs> if you have topics you'd like us to discuss, you can send them into badideashow at gmail.com. And the Love Canal, I, I wanted to tell this story, Tony, because I started researching this and I thought, if curses are real... This is proof of it. Because <laughs> everything goes so wrong on this particular bit of real estate for like a hundred years that it must be demon infested or like a Indian burial ground or cursed by God or something. Yeah, it's like one of those Hollywood stereotypes happened here. We start off, though, with a man and a dream. We're kicking this off way back in the late 1800s when a man named William T. Love had a dream of a town powered entirely by this new special kind of energy called electricity. And We've covered that before. We have. And in our discussion of electricity, you had an episode about DC power, which if you'll recall... At the time when DC Power ruled the electrical landscape, transmission lengths were very, very short. Because of the way DC Power works, you couldn't send it over miles and miles and miles of wire. So if you wanted to electrify an area, you needed to have the generator right there in the area. And William T. Love's idea was, rather than bringing the generator to the city... Why not bring the city to the generator? His plan was to dig a canal near Niagara Falls, divert some of the river water, run a hydroelectric system off of that canal, and use that electrical power to power his model city, a city of the future that would be electrified. And on top of that, the canal would also bring shipping into the city so rather than obviously you can't drive a ship up the niagara falls waterfalls because that doesn't work but his canal would be ship accessible so ships could drive up there and deliver things right to the factories he had factories investing in his little model city because he offered them free power once the city was built and this was going to be just this beautiful beacon on a hill proof of what the future could be with electricity and industry. I mean, I've heard worse ideas than actually getting everything all prepped so that these factories and everyone can have the infrastructure, have cheaper shipping, all that. Like, sounds like he had his head in the right place. It's not, this is not the bad idea, right? Like, this is just gonna turn into some bad luck to start with. Things start to go wrong for reasons beyond William Love's control. To start with... Love's funding starts to dry up. He has a lot of investors. He's a fast talker. He's able to get a bunch of people excited about his idea. But there's a depression that happens in 1897. And so all of these investors start pulling their money out of this venture that Love is trying to build up. Then Congress passes a law that specifically disallows this thing that William T. Love is trying to do, which is remove water from the upstream part of Niagara Falls because they don't want Niagara Falls to dry up. <laughs> they need that tourist trap. So William T. Love's dream is left as nothing more than a partially dug canal. He had started to dig this canal. He got about a mile long with it, and it just doesn't work out so he has to abandon it and the fascinating thing about William T. Love is we don't know where he came from and we don't know where he went he <laughs> appeared as this guy who had this brilliant idea for this city he had all of these sort of stories about how he had taken a bunch of people out west to Oklahoma but recent historical studies has checked up on Oklahoma and they're like nah we ain't got no record of William T. Love 
and we don't know what happened to him after this. Oh, I'm betting he changed his name or something like that. Like, maybe he even changed it before he started this one up. Love isn't exactly a common last name. Well, we have... The the most concrete thing I was able to find is that he might have gone to Alaska to try to pan for gold. But if he did, we don't have concrete records of that. So, love is gone. But the hole that he dug remained. And at first, it wasn't too bad. There was just this big extra river that was sort of parallel to the Niagara River, so people would swim in it in the summer, and they would skate on it in the winter, and that was pretty cool for them, even though the city didn't build up like Love had hoped. There was still sort of this nice area where people could swim. And then in the 1920s, the city of Niagara Falls started using this canal as a landfill. Things are getting bigger. There's lots of trash. You don't want it just sitting in the streets of your city. So they start toting it out to this big hole in the ground and throwing it in. I mean, that does sound like an ideal landfill spot. Like you can just take what's already there and fill it in. Yeah. Yeah. So this goes on for about 20 years. But in 1942, the Hooker Chemical Company comes onto the scene. We got hookers and love on all sorts of things in this episode. <laughs> the Hooker Chemical Company buys this land from the Niagara Falls city to use as a dumping site for their chemical waste. Now, Hooker Chemical might seem like an easy target as like the villain of this story, sort of the obvious giant industry raping the earth, throwing toxic barrels of chemicals into a pit in the ground and forgetting about them. But it's worth noting that they were as responsible as they were able to be with this process. Uh, the initial thing they do is they drain the canal, which still had water in it at this point. They make a clay lining of the inside of this pit that is going to house these chemicals so the chemicals can't leak out. And they try to be as responsible as they can be. And it's also, I think, worth noting that in 1942, we're talking about the wind-up to World War II. Like, Hooker Chemical is not just, like, making some random thing for store shelves. They're doing government work. There's probably a lot they could have gotten away with that, that it's actually surprising how few corners that they cut. Yeah, that usually doesn't fit the narrative whenever it's like, look, we we did everything the law told us to do, and we're trying to do this, and yeah, it's just not how those stories usually go. It's like, oh, we just decided to push it out the side of a truck. But it doesn't stay with Hooker Chemical, because in 1954, things are kicking off in the city of Niagara Falls. It is becoming a real destination for people to move and property prices are going through the roof and people are moving in which means that there are kids that need somewhere to go to school and the school council in the city of niagara falls starts looking around for some cheap land and they get their eye on this big old pit that doesn't have anything being done to it but having a bunch of chemicals in it and they say to the Hooker Chemical Company, Hey, y'all. How about you sell us that land? And the initial reaction from the Hooker Chemical Company is, Uh, no. <laughs> no, there, there's bad stuff in this land. And you're the school board. And you're telling us you want to build a school on top of it. And it's poison. Do you understand that there's poison in these barrels? This is not good. No. We don't want to sell you this land. I mean, did the people who play in, like, Flint, Michigan's water supply do this? What's going on? Listen, Tony, there's no constitutional right to clean water. <laughs> that is literally an argument that's being made in the Flint, Michigan area, by the way. They're like, you can't sue us because we're the government. And we're just here for the Constitution. And Constitution doesn't guarantee clean water. So, <laughs> but um, what? Take your lawsuit and go somewhere else. <laughs> the school council, though, is really, really interested in this land. And the Hooker Chemical Company finds out that the school council is going to use eminent domain on them if they don't sell them the land. 
They're just going to take it. And Hooker's legal counsel says to them, listen, you guys have put a bunch of poison in the ground. They're going to build a school over it. Why not go along with it? But in the deed to the property, say, listen, we told you this was a bad idea. We're not responsible if stuff goes wrong. And so they do that. They sell to the school council for a dollar. I mean, as a business d- decision, it's probably a little bit of a load off their minds being like, well, it's not our responsibility anymore. We don't have this toxic property. Well, I would assume yes. And they do on the way out also really try to make it as safe as they can. They say, okay, listen, great. You're going to build stuff here. We're putting a cap on this. We have a cap. It's made out of clay. I don't know exactly what kind of clay, but the the way it was worded made it sound like this is something that's waterproof if you don't puncture it. And they, they cap this stuff off. They say, okay, it should be safe if you don't go poking holes in our seal. Don't poke holes in our seal and maybe this will be fine. Here you go. We'll take our dollar. You take your poison land and we'll be cool. You guys aren't going to sue us, right? Because we did tell you that it was a poison land. (laughs) This, by the way, if you're at the, if you're looking for the bad idea, this is the moment that the bad idea occurs. The fact that the school board demands to be sold land where there is bad, bad, toxic chemicals under the ground because they're cheapskates and they don't want to raise taxes or maybe they can't raise taxes because the school board, um, so that they can build a school. And so they do it, okay? They build a school on top of this toxic waste. Now, you remember when the hooker people said, listen, okay, we don't want to do this, but definitely if we do do this, don't poke a hole in the seal that we made because there's poison inside. They decide to go fracking on it or something? They poke a hole in the in the clay thing with the poison inside in 1957 less than three years after the sale they're on the outskirts of this property digging a sewage line and they say whoops got a big hole in there uh it's probably not a big deal just a little rainwater get in there they'll be fine (laughs) and then again in 1962 they poke another hole in it and more rainwater gets in and now this rainwater is starting to a seep into these barrels and B erode the inside of this clay seal and open up the water table to contamination. Now it takes them a ridiculously long time to realize that this might be a problem. Despite the fact that there are puddles in the area that have this weird chemically sheen that children are playing in. I mean, I remember playing in oil slicks when I was a kid and I turned out just fine. It's not until 1976 that someone finally decides to test the water in the area to see if it's okay. Now, in 1976, the school board had managed to unload this toxic property onto a developer who had built houses on it because... It's not bad enough that you have your kids going to school on top of poison. Let's just have some people live there. The school board also had the foresight to include a clause that said, we ain't responsible either for any poisoning that happens because we signed that right away. So you also have to sign that right away. So confusing to me. It's like, how do people just keep doing this? Well, you can understand not wanting to be responsible for the giant poison pit. (laughs) Uh, The the thing is, the school board makes out like bandits on this because they bought it for a dollar. They built their thing on it and they sell it, I would imagine, to a developer for probably more than a dollar. Probably. In addition to these tests that reveal that there is horrible things happening to the water, there are also reports that... 56% of the children born in this Love Canal area have birth defects. Oof. And the residents of the area start seeing the tops of chemical barrels poking up through the ground in their yards. 
And at this point, the story essentially explodes into a national scandal. Now, the EPA had been recently created, so they get in on this. They start testing and figuring out what's going on, and they quickly realize uh, this is this is no bueno. The situation is bad, and we need to get people out. And so Congress approves the very first use of emergency funds for a non-natural disaster in the wake of the Love Canal crisis. They move 800 families out of the area and they pay for this to happen. But they don't want to be 100% on the hook for the money. So they start going to look for somebody to blame. And who do you think this comes back on, Tony? Mr. Love. No, he's been dead for like 100 years at this point. I mean, that's why it would be a very convenient scapegoat. <laughs> Also, he just dug a hole like some other people did put the bad stuff in the hole. <laughs> the Hooker Chemical Company ends up on the hook ha, huh, for $125 million. The school board ends up on the hook for $0 because, you know, let's not blame the guys who actually made the stupid decision. The horrible irony of this situation is, as and I'm I'm not a lawyer, and I the the articles I read were not written by lawyers, but from what I understand, if they had just let the school board use eminent domain to force them to give up the land, they would definitely not have been liable. They also probably would have gotten paid more. Possibly, I don't. Yeah, that that might have worked out better for them. I think. They thought their sort of little loophole in the deed would help them out, but the government didn't really care about that. They said, no, we had to pay $125 million to move these people, so you're going to reimburse us. And there's also the point that the company probably had $125 million, whereas the school board probably didn't. Yeah, that's a lot of uh, property tax. Yeah. So this is, you know, a, a tale of caution. Don't build a school on top of... A bunch of barrels of liquid poison. I. It's the most, maybe the most obvious bad idea we've ever done. And I'm still trying to process the fact that it actually happened. That like people were just willing to fully let these barrels sink up through into their yards and just build and build and build. Yes. Well, I can't blame the people who built the houses because I don't think the barrels were visible then. They might not have even known about the toxic waste. The developer who built the area probably didn't tell them, oh, hey, by the way, we're on top of an Indian burial ground and also a bunch of toxic wastes. So just so you know. But it was a huge turning point. It, it, it became a flashpoint for the environmental movement for a while because obviously... This was everything that the environmental types feared, that the modern chemicals that we had that were making all of our wonderful advances possible were also just killing us and killing the earth. And it's not always true, but it was true in this case. There was a lot of negligence and ultimately, I don't know if anybody died directly from this. I was not able to find a, a confer confirmed specific death because it's hard to prove in these kinds of situations exactly what would have caused, for instance, a cancer or something like that. But people ended up very much worse off because of this incredible malfeasance. And uh, that is the bad idea for this week. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Like, I don't, don't build your house on a chemical place. Or if you do, don't poke a hole in the seal. Don't go digging too deep. You should go to Patreon.com, though, and support this podcast by becoming a patron. $2, $5, $10 a month, lots of different cool stuff that we give you, and it supports the show. Also, check out our YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash Human Echoes, and check out our gaming content, among many, many other things that we produce. We will see you guys next week with more bad ideas. Bye, guys!